Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brandon Fess with the Local History and Genealogy Division of the Rochester Public Library. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation of Rochester's Rich History. Today, we'll be talking about the history of Rochester's Latino community. The Rochester Latino community traces its roots back to pioneers like Puerto Rican Domingo Delgado, a key East Minnesota executive of the 1890s. Like many immigrants before them, Latinos arrived in search of the better opportunities Rochester offered, and by the 1950s had an established community with churches and businesses. The 1960s and 1970s brought further development of the Latino identity, foreshadowing the growing political and economic power the community wields today. This presentation will cover the people and events that shaped Latino community and current trends in its booming growth. Our presenter today is Julio Sens. Julio serves as the Chief Communications Officer and Development Officer for the Ibero-American Action League. He also serves as the General Manager of Poder 97.1, having launched the station in 2015. Julio is also a professor in the School of Communications at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Sins has had a long career in media and community organizations, having served as the editor and publisher of newspapers in Rochester, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. He currently hosts Be Inspired, a weekly entrepreneurship program on WROC Channel 8. He holds a BA in International Relations and Mass Communications from Florida International University and a master's degree in marketing from Roberts Wesleyan College. Without further ado, I turn the floor to Julio Sins. Thank you so much. Uh, Brandon, uh, great to have you all here today. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled with the turnout. Um, I will try to make this pretty engaging. I, I present on this topic quite a bit and uh, being a professor, I speak a lot in front of folks. So, um, you know, I think this is a really uh, important topic that often gets overlooked. Um, and before I wrote this book, there was actually, um, there wasn't really anything on it. Um, so it took a lot of legwork meeting with families, meeting with uh, people that would hand over their family photos and, and, and give their oral history and recording all of that. Um, and so just to tell you a little bit about my about myself. I, I, I know we just did the bio, but I, I just want to emphasize that I've covered this community for a long time uh, with my own newspaper, which then um, Conexion, which was then uh, bought by the Democratic Chronicle. And then I worked for them for a number of years. Uh, covering the community here. So it's a community I care a lot about and I know well. And the reason I emphasize this is just because, you know, in this era of, of fake news, you really have to, um, you know, double check your sources. Um, you know, worked, uh, been an editor and publisher of newspapers around the country. And I currently work for Ibero running their radio station, Poder, doing their communications and fundraising. And I'm also a professor at RIT in the School of Communications. I know we have a, a bunch of all right, two students today, I welcome you to take one of my classes uh, in the coming semesters. So, you know, all of this, um, I originally got the idea to write this book when I was um, uh, running Conexión. And uh, I actually did a retro, episode, um, retro edition of the 1970s. It was so cool, it had the 1970s like funky colors and the design and found all these photos. And I realized, I started to realize just how law you know I, as i researched that edition i talked to people who would say oh yeah my family was one of the first ones here we got here in the 60s and so that was kind of like the um the the starting point that most people held in their mind as far as how long the community had been here and when i started to talk to people for that edition people would say yeah we got here in the 60s but you should really go talk to um, you know, the Lopez's, they got here in the 50s. And then, but then the Lopez family would tell me, hey, no, there was people here in the 40s and the 30s and the 20s. And it just kept going back further and further. The other thing that inspired me to, to research and write this book was that, you know, we're all uh, at the time, and God knows it's even worse now, there was a lot of uh, anti immigrant rhetoric. And, uh, Unfortunately, it's gotten worse, but it was amazing. And what, well, what drove me to write it too was the fact that people act like we just got here. And we've been here since the founding of the country, um, very involved. I, I love history. I can talk about how many Latinos you know, served in the, in the Civil War, how, many, how important General Galvez was to the, to the, uh, um, to the United States winning the, the Revolutionary War. In fact, that's what that's Galveston is named after him. Uh, so there's tons of history that you know we've always been here and so uh, including in Rochester it's not just in the southwest it's not just 
in Florida. You know, we've been here for a long, long time. So what we're going to talk about today are the early roots of the community. Um, so those first pioneers that got here, then the Great Migration, which when we saw a significant number of folks move to um, New York and consequently Rochester. Talk about Los Primeros, the, those first families that really um, put roots down and helped create a lot of the organizations. So that, tra that transition us, transitions us to the roots of organization and you know, when, when the institutions that we have in the community now were founded. And then once those were in place, how the community blossomed. And then we'll talk a little bit about where the community is today. I have some demographic data. I, I do a lot um, you know, in marketing through Ibero and in other things. So I, I'm very um, attuned to what the latest numbers are in the community. So, so this, uh, what I hope you walk away with is a historical understanding of the community the trends that shaped today's community. So how did we get here where we are today? And then a factual understanding of where we are, because a lot of times we, um, you know, we, we, it's common to, to share, to hear and share misinformation because we just don't know any better. And um, a lot of times we take things uh, from other Latinos just because we think they're experts. And being Latino does not make you an expert in the Latino community. It gives you a great base. It gives you cultural competency but it doesn't necessarily mean you know the, the, a lot of the facts that are, uh, that are common. So I'm, I'm, I'm often surprised when I talk to Latinos, when I tell them some of the things about the community that they're, they're shocked, you know? And so we'll talk a little bit about, you know, where we are today, as I said, and where, what issues we face going forward, okay? So let's talk about the early roots. So the earliest roots, uh, you can't talk about the roots of Rochester without talking about New York City. So um, yeah, connection with New York City has always been there. And so let's talk a little bit about that, that jumping off point where people first arrived. So, um, you know, in, in the, as early as the 1850s, I mean, there, there've been Latinos, Hispanics immigrating to the US since, since we were founded, okay? And even before. So, but in the 50s, there was actually a sizable amount of leadership um, that was, um, exiled to, to New York City because of the independence movements in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Catalonia, so in Spain. And um, you had folks that, that were experienced leaders, people that, um, that were educated, that they were there. And basically Spain told people back then, if you, well, if you wanna be you know, independista, you either, you either go to jail or you, or you get exiled. So a lot of those folks were in New York City and they all got to know each other. They all got to be friends. And that's actually why um, the three flags are so similar. They were created at the same time by the same people. I hear sometimes people, I, I hear the, you know, really unnecessary debates between people sometimes. Oh, well, the Cubans copied the Puerto Rican flags. The Puerto Ricans copied the Cuban flag. None of that's true. Okay, they actually were all designed at the same time. And actually the stripes were basically inspired by the, the stripes for Catalonia, which go back to medieval times. This triangle is actually a Masonic symbol. A lot of the uh, uh, independence movements in Latin America were, were led by, by, by Masons, um, Bolivar, you know, Somoza and Jose Marti, all of them. Uh, and then the star standing for independence. So let's talk, you know, that, those roots in New York City. And that community got established. Here's just some photos of people with, a lot of people have never seen the, the independence flag uh, for Catalonia. And, you know, you can see it's very widely used uh, over there. But those, those leaders in, in um, New York City eventually started forming organizations like this Liga Puerto Riqueña, um, you know, at the turn of last century down in New York City. You can see they got their instruments, some of the guys holding a maraca, you know, so always carrying that culture with them. Uh, and eventually some of those folks made their way to New York City for many reasons. And interviewing different families, it was fascinating to hear the stories. Like there was one family, um, the Burgos family, um, very, very prominent family here in the community. Um, the father that originally came here uh, worked for um, a Jewish family in their, in their bakery making bagels. And when they opened a, a branch up here, you know, he was a great employee. They loved him. They wanted him to come up here and, and help establish that here. So uh, there's a lot of those uh, small connections of how people got here. 
And as I was researching this book, like I say, it just kept going further and further back uh, with each family I, I talked to. And I'd follow these leads. And so one of the most interesting ones is Domingo Delgado, who was an executive for Kodak in the 1890s, as early as like, I think he, he came to work for them like in 1892 or something like that. And he was actually in charge of their foreign market. So in this era of global business, where we realize how important that is, Domingo was actually the person that established all of Kodak's markets outside of Europe. So, you know, very key person. He was actually recruited by George Eastman to come work for uh, Kodak. So as far as in the 1890s, we had a presence here. And now we probably go back much further, but this is the first person that we have documented because he was a very prominent businessman in the area. His family still, his descendants still live in the area. Um, and we just happened that he was, you know, that prominent and that he worked for a, a photography company. So we have a photo of him, but there was certainly people, you know, the chances of him being the first one are low given, you know, the number of, of folks that were in the state already. So from him, you start to uh, find other families that were here, you know, in my research that were here in the 1920s. So there, um, one of those really interesting families was the Diaz family. Similar uh, situation, uh, moved from New York um, City to here, had some kind of, yeah, I don't remember their story right now as far as the business that he worked for, but similar. He came here because a business that he worked for based in New York. Uh, asked him to to come to come relocate here, and um, so this was a couple brothers, Julio Diaz, and his brother Carlos Lopez, who actually um, actually no, they're friends, they're family friends. But Carlos Lopez actually started a, a, a business here in Rochester, did very well, and that first Latino community was in Dutchtown, which is on the west side of the city around Buffalo Road. Uh, so it's still there. And I was, um, I've talked to, to his daughter, interviewed her extensively, and it was a, a, a rich neighborhood made up of lots of immigrants, uh, people from Puerto, Puerto Rico, Carlos Lopez and, and, and Diaz were both Puerto Rican. There was immigrants from Spain there, just all kinds of uh, Ukrainians, just everything, you know, melting, true melting pot, Irish, everything. So um, this gentleman actually was, uh, um, as I said, established a strong electronics business here in Rochester, um, served in World War II like a, like a lot of Latinos. And World War II, and this is him with his wife and, and their daughter, um, World War II was a pivotal, pivotal moment in the immigration of uh, Latinos to the US and specifically Puerto Ricans. So, and this was one of the triggers of the great migration. So, and there's a similar, um, you know, move, well, I wouldn't call it a movement, but it was a similar experience for a lot of African-Americans and they all, it's also called the great migration in that community uh, and driven by a lot of the similar um, uh, factors. But the great migration starting um, with World War II drove a lot of folks to move to the United States, New York City and consequently Rochester. So a couple of, uh, well, the three factors were the great depression. So that primed not only Puerto Rico, but a lot of Latin America with a lot of unemployment, a lot of economic hardship. Um, Great Depression affected, you know, uh, all those areas because it was not only was it a global depression, but a lot of Latin America dependent on the U.S. for its uh, the, you know, it, it was its main market for the for the purchase of lots of um, agricultural products and and other. Um, uh, things that they produce. So the Great Depression, we had a lot of unemployment, a lot of um, people out of work. Uh, then World War II came along. A lot of folks, um, you know, came to the U.S. to help uh, work um, in factories and farms. And in Puerto Rico, because they were citizens, a lot of those folks fought in World War II. Uh, the third factor, uh, which came right around World War II and afterwards, was affordable air travel. Um, and right now we're going to talk quite a bit about Puerto Rico. So um, I myself am I'm, I'm half Cuban and half Puerto Rican. So it's not, it's not some favoritism. It really, you know, it's just that in Rochester, uh, a large part of the community was and still is Puerto Rican. But uh, the, the, the migration from Puerto Rico was primarily through air travel. And it's the first um, migration of mass migration in human history that was done primarily through air travel. Um, and a lot of those families that came in the 40s, you started to get families like the Padillas, which is another very prominent family here in the area. Um, those families, as I said, they would come up here for, for different, through different family connections. Um, 
you know, from, from Puerto Rico to New York City and then to uh, Rochester. So here's a uh, uh, advertisement for the, from the time uh, from El Diario in Puerto Rico for Trans Caribbean Airlines in 1958 with a $45 one-way ticket from San Juan to New York City. Um, so you can see it just became a very feasible thing. Before that, um, steamships were expensive. You know, to take a ship was actually very expensive. Uh, if you've seen Titanic, you know how, um, you know, it was very well-to-do people. And then those that were immigrating were like at the bottom of the ship. Uh, uh, and it really was uh, something that was expensive. Um, and so air travel really opened it up to just about everybody. Okay. And here's a plane, um, you know, leaving for Puerto Rico to New York City in 1948. Um, and then another factor in all this, speaking of the people that came to work at the time and, and for many decades after, there was actually a, a program um, started by the U.S. government to recruit uh, farm workers in Puerto Rico to come work in the farms in the U.S. And guess what we have all around us? If you've ever driven, if you live outside of the city, you know this. If you've driven for 10 minutes in any direction, we're surrounded by, you know, fantastic, uh, you know, uh, agriculture all around us. And so a lot of those families, a lot of those workers came to work in Rochester in the farms surrounding the area. And so here's a here's a photo of illustrating just that. This is Felix Perez, um, fam, um, you know, the of a very prominent family here in Rochester. I could go on and on about all the people in this family that are, have um, done a lot in this community. And here he is in, in Brant, New York, which is outside of Syracuse, working on one of the farms. Okay, and up here and eventually liked it. And so this is what where we get a though we had those that core of pioneers that had been here since the you know turn of the century, uh, when we saw the great migration reached Rochester in that time, like in the late 40s and the 50s, and the community really started to take off. Uh, people like Felix Perez, a lot of families like that that came to work. Um, in the area, and eventually they liked it, they stayed, and then they brought their family over, they brought their wives, they brought their kids. Um, this photo was something he actually sent to his family back in Puerto Rico and eventually brought people over. Um, and then a lot of them transitioned from those agricultural jobs to a lot of the factories that we had here at the time, which we still do have a fair amount, but we had, Rochester was a booming uh, uh, manufacturing town, and a lot of them got jobs in in the in the food uh, industry that was here. So Ragu was a very famous place um, that a lot of Latinos worked at. The Ger Gerber um, also had its factory here at the time. Both those companies were based, founded and based in Rochester and they employed a, a lot of Latinos that transitioned over. And then eventually they started getting jobs, you know, at, at some of the other factories in the area and, and doing well for themselves. So in the fifties, you really start to see a lot of the, the lights come on, um, the, the I, I guess the benchmarks or the signs of a, of a thriving community. So you start to get like Latino owned uh, businesses, churches. Uh, this is a dance at a community center. Uh, actually, this is at a church hall, but so there's enough Latinos here to have, you know, parties and, and a band. So in the fifties you had Pedro Nunez and, and, and his group, which was playing at like Oak Hill Country Club. And re remember this is the fifties, Ricky Ricardo, um, Mambo music, very, very popular at the time. And so you have, um, you know, entertainment now in the area that's, that's Latino, uh, that's uh, playing at different locations. Um, you know, and a lot of family was still mostly migrating to the Northeast part of Rochester. So originally a lot of that was in Dutchtown. A lot of it started to move over to the Northeast side, always around the churches. A lot of what you're gonna hear in my in the presentation is the, um, the bond between the, the, the churches and the community. Um, and so here's a photo from the Democrat Chronicle. Luckily, you know, with my connection with the Democrat Chronicle, they were kind enough to give me access to their archive. So this is from 19th, January, January 16th, 1955. Uh, and this is uh, a, um, a Puerto Rican supermarket on Otis Street, uh, 83 Otis Street. Um, and it says, the, 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 the line says they operate one of two Spanish stores in Rochester, importing much of their food from Puerto Rico itself. There's also a Puerto Rican restaurant in the city. So there's enough folks here to, to buy this stuff. And I believe she's holding a can of Bustelo coffee, which 
uh, is still around and one of my favorites. So um, churches as well. This is from a this is from a pretty extensive spread that was done on the growth of the Latino of the Puerto Rican community in the Democrat and Chronicle um, in 1955. It was a pretty extensive article, and so this is one of this is um, these are uh, as it says these are Puerto Ricans uh, at a at a church, um, you know, a Rochester Salvation and Christian Church on 34 Lawn Street. So we had uh, you know churches being uh, a point of uh, of contact of you know organizing the community. We'll talk a lot about that. A lot of the main community, a lot of those first communities were in the Northeast because they were around the churches. First of all, St. Bridget's, which is no longer around. Um, it's over there by the Coca-Cola plant, um, not far from the Genesee Brewery uh, behind some of the factories over there. But that was the first uh, um, church that had a large congregation among, among the Catholic churches. And the Catholic church played a big role. At this point, and we talk about demographic shifts, at this point, a lot of the Latinos were, um, were Catholic. Um, and we can get into a whole discussion on Protestants and Catholics in Puerto Rico around uh, statehood and some other things. But um, at this point, a lot of the Latinos that were coming over were Catholic. The other church that had a large congregation was Mount Carmel, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, which is also since closed, uh, which you know is, is indicative of, of the shift um, away from the church and some of the communities. Uh, but these churches did a lot to organize the community. They founded um, the Spanish Apostolate, which was an office to work with uh, the Latino community. And they organized these, um, these types of retreats, these events that would organize the community, would bring everybody together. This is a Spanish cursillo or workshop in 1966. Um, and you can see the number of people. A lot of future leaders in the community are in these photos. If you if you get a chance to pick up a copy of the book, you'll see in the bylines, in the, in the cut line, I should say, you'll see like a lot of uh, really prominent people named Father Tracy's in this photo, Jose Cruz, um, a lot of folks that would later on become leaders in the community. So this is a, a workshop for some, for some youth, same thing. Um, and the churches weren't just about religion. They, they were you know, a social um, gathering point. And so other, other things that led to organization in the community came out of the church. So for example, here's the, the Knights of St. John. So it was a Latino uh, service organization, you know, uh, the Knights of San Juan, and it was based in Mount Carmel. And they did good things in the community, just like maybe the Elks or some of these other organizations. So this was founded out of Mount Carmel. Um, here's a photo of the, fir of the Latino, first Latino uh, Boy Scout troop. I, I love this photo. It's one of my favorite photos that I, uh, that I came across in my research. Um, and so here's a you know, Latino Boy Scout troop out of Mount Carmel as well. So these are all things that start to bring people together, start to give them a, an identity of, of themselves and, and of their role here in Rochester, connect with each other, which then leads to you know, organization in other areas. Okay. Um, one of the other very prominent churches was Holy Redeemer Church on, um, on Hudson and Clifford. Uh, and that's actually where Ibero was founded. So Ibero, who I work for, uh, you know, Ibero, just tell you a little bit about Ibero, where uh, we were founded by the Catholic Diocese with a grant of maybe $5,000 and a couple of employees in the basement of this building. And we are now up to 300 employees. We have offices in Buffalo, Rochester, Geneva, Amsterdam and Albany. So we basically cover the whole state, uh, except New York City. Um, and so, you know, this large organization, one of the largest Latino organizations in the country was founded uh, here at Holy Redeemer Church in the basement. Uh, the diocese eventually gave this building to Ibero and we actually still, we still own it. This is where we later, decades later, launched our charter school, uh, Eugenio de Maria Ostos Charter School, which is like the oldest charter school here that's still, you know, of the original, the original four that were founded and has over a thousand students. It's moved on to several other buildings now because it's grown so much. Um, so in that 60s, this root, you know, you have the roots of organization starting in the church. You have Ibero that's founded. Um, we have our first elected Latino official, Edwin Rivera in 1963. He was elected to what became the Monroe County Legislature. Uh, we actually have our, um, the, the uh, Young Lords, we actually had a chapter here in Rochester and it grew out of the Puerto Rican Student Union um, in, um, at Franklin. 
Uh, and this is a picture of uh, Roberto Burgos, Jose Cruz, uh, both very prominent leaders in the community when they were still high school kids, part of this group. And the, the Young Lords were uh, a Latino, uh, were inspired by the Black Panthers, uh, a lot of the same agenda around bringing social programs uh, and um, positive self-identity to the youth and to, to the Latinos in the area. So they did a lot of great things. These are a bunch of high school kids. This is a, an actual copy of a letter they sent to uh, City Hall, um, demanding that City Hall clean up the garbage in, in the Latino neighborhoods, specifically North Clinton Avenue, Cole Street, uh, where the, the garbage was just piling up and the city wasn't picking it up. And so they actually wrote this letter to City Hall demanding that, um, that they get uh, rakes and shovels so they could clean it up themselves. Um, you know, I, I, it's, I'm, I'm amazed that these were just high school kids doing, doing this and organizing this. And when the city didn't give them the stuff, they went out and did it themselves. This is actually a photo of them out there uh, cleaning. This is, I believe, Upper Falls, out there cleaning the community themselves. And these are a bunch of, of kids. This is uh, Nancy Padilla up here with the broom, who would later be elected to city count to the to city council, the first Latino elected to let, uh, to um, city council and the school board as well, first Latina on the school board. And Henry Padron, who's back there as well, who is a, a local poet, teacher, and owns a Hippocampo bookstore now in the South Wedge. So, all right, so this has been all pretty cool, right? This is all uh, pretty smooth sailing so far. Um, there were a couple of incidents that really brought the community together. So you had the roots of organization, that, that self-identity, that identity as a community, but then the community faced a couple of challenges. Now there had been discrimination all along. Uh, I, I helped uh, Julio Vasquez uh, write and well, edit his memoirs a number of years ago. And you know, there's a lot of stories of discrimination that both he and his father um, faced, especially from the police. And so uh, this didn't just come out of nowhere, but it came to a head um, in uh, when Midtown Plaza opened in the 60s. It was this gleaming, beautiful, you know, jewel of Rochester's, you know, business and, and retail community. Uh, it was the first indoor downtown mall in the country, and it was beautiful. I used, to, I used to go there as a kid. And what actually started to happen was um, Latinos were being beat up and or thrown out of Midtown. Um, some folks were there just hanging out. Um, you know, some of the the folks that were alive in that area will talk about the fact that a plaza in Latin America is like like the central town park, the central like communal area, and so that's where you go and you hang out and you your friends come by and you talk. I mean, I still do this when I go to Costa Rica. I go to uh, La Plaza right in front of the main church, and I run. I end up running into relatives and people who know my family, and it's and so the, the Midtown Plaza. Going back to that name, um, attracted you know a number of Latinos who you know were just socializing there, which you know you could call loitering, all right. And under the auspices of loitering and um, you know causing trouble, a lot of these people were being thrown out of Midtown. And there was and if I remember research researching the um, articles out of the DNC, I mean there was one weekend I remember, and it wasn't even this one that caused like this final showdown. It was one maybe that summer where like like 23 people were, were thrown out, uh, beat up and thrown out of Midtown. So these kind of moments really bring a community together. You, you're facing a common adversary. There's outrage. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's an issue regardless of, you know, what your income is or anything else. Your, your whole community is facing this, this issue. It's an outrage. It's a, it's a moral issue. It's a social justice issue. Um, and so this, this particular event really rallied the community together. And so in, in, Feb in February 4th in 1969, so we're in February right now, as you can imagine how freezing it is right now. Uh, and, and, you know, these guys out there in, in their coats, uh, you can see some of them have pretty light coats out there and they stood out there all day in front of the, uh, the public safety building until the, the chief of police would agree to meet with them to talk about this issue and the, the mistreatment of Latinos by, by the RPD. And they did eventually that day agree to meet with them. Uh, once again, we have Julio Vasquez in here and a number of other prominent leaders in the community um, that they finally did agree to meet with uh, with them. Um, and um, you know, they did things did get better. They did hire a Spanish-speaking officer and made him a liaison to the community. Things did did get better. 
the other second major event that brought the community together in, in sort of this, this broad, um, you know, sense of outrage and coming together to fight for something uh, was in the 70s when the school district tried to get rid of bilingual education. Uh, this was this happened like right around 1970. It was going on there for a bit, but the school district basically tried to eliminate it. And um, the Latino leadership actually did a, uh, a march from Franklin all the way to uh, City Hall. Uh, and then eventually later on, they took over, they did a sit-in, which you know was the thing to do back in the 70s, but effective. They, they took over the uh, school district building and refused to leave until you know this was uh, resolved. And actually, there's actually a legal document now that exists because of that, um, that you know guarantees that the school district will you know always provide bilingual education. So those two moments are important, not just because they're interesting moments in history, but when you when you study you know communities and countries, there's usually certain challenges that just galvanize people, that bring them together, give them a stronger sense of who they are and their common their commonality. So you can talk about this like in the United States, you know, there's, there's you know a lot of historians would tell you that we were just a you know collection of states and territories until the War of 1812. Like okay, you mean we, we can't stay free? There's people that want to take us back to be a colony. And, and that brought uh, those 13 you know, colonies together and really gave them a sense of, well, you know, we are a country. And after that, you know, the rest is history. So <clears throat> throughout history, there's moments like that that give um, a community a self, self of identity because of the conflict that they're facing. So these two events are very important for that. Okay. From there, uh, the community really started to take off. Uh, during this period, you know, the, those leadership, those institutions, you know, you have Ibero now, you have uh, the Puerto Rican festival um, was established, um, you know, and we had our first festival, which then was like a, a week long event. This is actually one of the festivals and the mayor at the time is reading the proclamation, big celebration at city hall with traditional musicians and you know, lots of lots of um, activities starting to happen in the community. Um, this is North Clinton Avenue, 1975, from the Democratic Chronicle archives. You can see just you know tons of of Latino businesses just right up and down North Clinton. There's St. Michael's in the background. You know, there's a, a um, there's a Latino um, optometrist. There's a, a Joyeria La Mina was a very famous uh, jewelry store. Um, you know, down the street, there's a, a bowling alley and uh, Renez was a famous restaurant on the corner. Here's another picture of, um, in this other picture to the left, um, uh, this gentleman named Manolo who owned a restaurant there at the time. Um, and, you know, if you looked in, if you could see the, the image in, hanging in his window, there's also a poster for Lucha Libre. So we, you know, even like wrestling and everything. So all these types of um, manifestations of the culture of things we enjoy, you know, really kicking in. So, you know, the seventies, that community is really taking off, um, around the Northeast part of town, um, you know, continued to grow for a number of years. Um, and we'll talk about why some of the reasons why it started to decline, um, in some, in some ways. Um, so starting in, so we're in the seventies, we're into the eighties now. And in the eighties and in the nineties, we saw a phenomenon that we hadn't really had in Rochester before, and certainly not to the level that it reached. In that era, we actually started to have a lot of the area's large employers, Kodak, Xerox, uh, Bosch and Lom, you know, the school district, the universities, start to really pay attention to uh, bringing talent from all over, you know, and the value of that, you know, finding, you know, great minds wherever they were. And they started to uh, hire a lot of Latinos from a lot of places. Uh, a big contingent from Universidad de Puerto Rico Mayagüez, so University of Puerto Rico and Mayagüez, which is one of the best engineering schools in the country, actually in the world, let me take that back. Um, I think I've seen it ranked in the top 20 in the whole world. So one of the best engineering schools in the world. And most of these people that you see in these photos are engineers. They're, and here they are in Rochester celebrating a traditional Christmas paranda with, with the different friends. So at this point you start to see um, you know, hundreds if not thousands of Latinos that are relocating to Rochester, um, specifically you know, um, recruited to come to Rochester to work for these companies, highly educated, professional, many class, in many cases, middle or upper class um, from their upbringing. And a lot of these folks 
well, just about all of them moved straight to the suburbs. Not for any reason. That's that was you know Xerox is in Webster. A lot of these folks I, I know personally, they moved to Webster. They moved to you know to be near RIT, to be near U of R, and wherever they live, Park Avenue, East Avenue, wherever. I mean that no one has to live in one area just because you know that is some kind of designation. You can live wherever you want, um, and that's all great. Um, but what it uh, why it's important is you have just a whole. Um, middle and upper middle class, you know, segment of Latinos just moving to Rochester like that within a span of a few years. Um, one of the factors that's interesting in this is this, this is, you're talking about thousands of people who no longer are coming through Clinton Avenue for the first time or the Northeast or Dutchtown, those traditional immigrant neighborhoods where you maybe come, you spend 10, 20 years, uh, you know, you do well, maybe your kids move out to the suburbs um, you know, you, you get your kids into college or you yourself do well and start your own business and you, you become, um, you know, um, upwardly mobile. And so, but you have that tie to the community. You know, we can talk about St. Michael's and when we all went there, you know, we talk about I mean, the super duper and we all shopped there at some point, you know, when we were all coming up through that neighborhood. And so you have this uh, whole generate, you know, a whole group of people that have, you know, uh, migrated straight to the suburbs and skipped that step. So that brings us to where we are today. Um, the thriving community, um, you know, we have about, um, we estimate over about 81,000 Latinos in Rochester, uh, which is a tremendous growth. Latinos as a whole are the largest minority in the country now. And we're also the largest minority in New York state. So um, just been, been uh, growing exponentially. Um, so yeah, here's a couple of points I, I jumped ahead on. So we're the second largest Latino country in the world. The United States is the second largest Latino country in the world after only Mexico. So we have more, if you were to take the Hispanics in the United States, there's more here than there are in all of Spain and all of Colombia and all of Argentina. Um, if you were to take just the Hispanics in the United States, we'd be the 11th largest economy in the world. Um, you know, as I said, largest minority group, make up 18% of the total population and 25% of everyone under the age of 18. Locally, 46% of Latinos live in the Rochester suburbs. So, um, you know, we, we've seen this migration to the suburbs and people that came directly from other parts of the country and moved straight to, to the suburbs. So it's, it's, um, it's created some, um, some challenges and some opportunities, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, just a general map of where Latinos are concentrated in the United States, as you can see, you know, in the Southwest, uh, in Florida, and then in New York and, and Illinois. Um, and in the area, uh, things that have, uh, have, have um, occurred over the last few years is that the community's gotten much more diverse. It's not um, predominantly, well, it's still predominantly Puerto Rican, but it, you know, it was, there was a point where it's probably like 90, 90 percent uh, Puerto Rican. Now it's in the 60s, and we've seen large migrations of Cubans, Dominicans, um, Central Americans, South Americans, a, a lot of different folks in the area. Uh, it's deconcentrated, so as I mentioned, it's no longer just in the Northeast. Uh, a lot of folks either moved or relo relocated from another part of the country, moved straight to the um, uh, other parts of this of the area. Uh, there's a lot of professionals in the area, higher incomes. It's also English dominant. Um, so I run a radio station that plays Latin music, and a lot of it is, in, most of it is in Spanish. So, um, but we have a lot of DJs who speak both languages, or sometimes even just English, because a lot of the folks here are third, fourth, fifth generation. As I've as I've illustrated in this presentation, you're talking about people with some deep roots here, going back to the, the 20s, the 30s. So of course, we're up to this fifth, sixth generation. So it gets harder to maintain the culture. And we do have people that are what, what's considered a third culture, where you take a, a blend of both, you know? And that, you know, that, and so and that's um, a concept called models of acculturation, how different folks acculturate eventually, how much of their uh, you know, original culture do they keep or pass on to their kids? How much do you absorb of the, of the new one? And obviously the healthiest thing is having, you know, a balance of, of both, not going to one extreme where you forget who you are or, you know, the other extreme where you refuse to acculturate either. So um, locally in the business world, you know, we've had a, a number of, um, um, you know, uh, changes in the economy and, and powerful impact from, you know, Latinos or, you know, Hispanics, 
you know, we had a CEO of Kodak who, who was from Spain. We have um, Genesee Brewery, which is now owned by a company from Costa Rica called Imperial. If you've ever traveled to Costa Rica, you probably had a beer there on the beach. Imperial actually is a company from Costa Rica that bought Genesee Brewery probably about uh, a good seven or eight years ago now. And Iberdrola brought, bought rg &E, big multinational company out of Spain. Both cases, they relocated executives here. Costa Rica brought executives here to help oversee Imperial, um, Genesee Brewery. And Genesee Brewery is a very large brewery. They also make Sam Adams and a lot of other brands that you know. Um, and then Iberdrola, same thing. For a while, this was their headquarters. And so uh, a lot of, you know, hundreds of folks were relocated here from Spain. Um, even Java, Java's, which is down the street from Iberdrola, started serving a cortado just because they had so many Spaniards walking down from their headquarters to have coffee there. So a uh, big impact in the community. Uh, as I talked about earlier, here's a, uh, the growth of the community. You can see, uh, you know, went from maybe 6,000 in, in the 70s all the way up to uh, 75,000. And it took a huge jump in the last few years because of Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria, uh, we estimated Ibero because Ibero helped settle the families that came here. Uh, we estimated brought about another 8,000 Latinos. So you can see how we're up to about 82, you know, 83,000 Latinos here in the area. Ibero itself, we set, we helped 6,500 people, so six and a half thousand people, and not everybody came through us because they they had families that they had resources and had money, and we know of lots of families that never asked us for help. They just came, they had money, they bought a house, they bought a condo, they got a job, and so we that's why we estimated beyond the six and a half to seven thousand people we helped, it's probably closer to eight thousand people. Okay. Um, so this is Hurricane Maria. Here's here's one of the centers where we were helping people, um, you know, as they arrived, uh, find, you know, housing, coats. A lot of these folks came. I remember a lot of these folks arrived in November without any winter clothing or anything else. And I have to say, you know, everyone listening, the Rochester community was outstanding. That's one of the reasons I love living in Rochester, even though I've lived in Miami and LA and Atlanta. I love Rochester. Just the, the heart of the people in this community was amazing. We had people from all over the Rochester region just dropping off winter coats and gloves and food and appliances and everything to help these folks. So um, those folks, um, this is a heat map uh, produced by um, uh, Homeland Security. I actually got to be a part of a conference with them, uh, which was great. It was all about helping people uh, settle in in the areas, and this was came out of a New York State one that was done. So you can see where people settled um, from the hurricane in Rochester. And you can see, it's, though, you have that concentration in the in the traditional neighborhood in the Northeast on North Clinton uh, and Norton in that area. You have pockets all over. You have people in the South Wedge, the Southwest. Um, you know, going on Webster, Greece, everywhere, Gates, all over. Um, and even before. Uh, Hurricane Maria, uh, there was a, already, we were already starting to see a substantial flow of people coming to Rochester and to the US, US because of some of the economic trouble um, in Puerto Rico. You know, maybe you saw in the news at the time the problems with the, uh, the solvency of the, of the Puerto Rican government and other things. And because of that, all the cuts they made to employees. And, and it's become a place where companies go to hire nurses and doctors and teachers and everything. So even before the hurricane, so you know, we were already having a, a, a jump in, in uh, folks coming. So this is an old statistics, but it's just to show you um, some of the breakdown of the community. I hopefully we'll get you know, data from the 2020 census soon. This is from 2010. And um, so this is old data, but you can see just how much the community's grown from that 54,000 in, in 2010. Um, but then you can see Puerto Ricans still made 72% of the population, Mexicans 6.2, Cubans uh, 5.3, and then other, for some reason in the 2010, they didn't count Dominicans as a separate, as their own category. So they were lumped into others because we do have a very large Dominican population here in Rochester. Okay. Um, so a little bit about each community, Puerto Ricans uh, still, as we talked about, is the main um, community. A lot of your third, fourth, fifth generation folks, a lot of the families that have been here a long time are Puerto Rican. Uh, and consequently, a lot of the leadership in the community is still predominantly Puerto Rican. Um, you know, Dominicans, 
you know, a lot of great Dominican restaurants in the area, a sizable population, you know, uh, large enough to have on several occasions, you know, their own concerts there. The, um, there was a, a community group, uh, Sociedad Dominicana, which I, I've talked to a few people who are trying to bring that back. But, um, you know, large population of Dominicans, if I had to estimate, I'd probably put it at about 8,000 easily. Um, and then Cubans, this is actually a picture from my family. Um, and, uh, you know, Cubans came in the, in the 60s after Castro. And then we saw another bump in the 70s. Uh, in the late 70s, some uh, uh, with the churches helping resettle people from the Mariel boat lift, some also came. And then the last probably 10 years, we've had quite a few as well uh, arriving. Um, and we actually have our first Cuban restaurant. I'll, I can talk a lot about food. Uh, there's a great Cuban restaurant, um, El Divino on... Um, Lyle near, near Mount Hope, great Cuban sandwiches, really authentic Cuban food, great, great place. Uh, Mexicans, as I've talked about, we uh, have a large population here, uh, mostly um, in the rural areas in the, in the region, it's following a similar pattern to Puerto Ricans decades before, coming as uh, migrant workers and eventually, um, you know, some deciding to stay year round and make Rochester their home. Uh, Central Americans, as I mentioned, we Imperial is then, you know, now, I mean, Genesee Brewer is now owned by uh, Imperial. Uh, we actually have a, a large Panamanian community. This is a, a, a local dance troupe, a Panamanian dance troupe, um, and other, you know, Hondurans and other Central Americans in the area, uh, Guatemalans as well um, in the area. Colombians, we've been having more and more over the last few years. Uh, for a while, Alpina, which is a very famous uh, Colombian um, Dairy Company had a factory uh, in Batavia uh, and same thing, relocated people here. Uh, and uh, we did have a Colombian restaurant in Batavia and there was one in on Monroe Avenue as well that, that closed unfortunately about a year ago, but sizable population. Also, there's a group here, um, you know, that, that's active. Chileans, we have a, a population going back to the 60s. Um, you know, Maria, Jose and Maria's empanada stop in, in uh, public market is actually owned by Jose here. They're uh, um, Chilean. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Don Francisco, the host of um, Saul Gigante for many years, who's Chilean, actually lived here in Rochester for a while before making his way to Miami and becoming really famous. As I said, Spaniards, we have a, a large uh, population of Spaniards here because of Iberdrola. Uh, and as I said, some, some were coming here even in the 1920s um, into that Dutch town area. So a long history of Spaniards here in the area as well. Um, and then Peruvians, another population that has its, its own group that meets here uh, and starts to, you know, and has a, an annual picnic. A lot of these communities have, you know, an association, even if it's loosely on Facebook, they get together, you know, and, and celebrate important holidays or independence days those kinds of things. And so you can see a lot more diverse. Um, and um, interestingly enough, um, one of the things the Latino leaders talk a lot about that we, we talk a lot about is um, the impact of people dispersing throughout the county. It's normal, no one has to stay in one area, you know, that, that, that wouldn't be right. Uh, people have an option to live wherever they want. Uh, but some of the impact that it's caused is we have lost political clout. Uh, because we're no longer in, in one area that can necessarily vote and always guarantee that there's Latinos elected from that area, which traditionally was the Northeast part of the city. We have every, everyone's everywhere. And that also makes it harder to communicate. It's one of the reasons I started Conexión, and that's why Conexión is called Conexión, which means connection, was my goal was to connect both the city and the suburbs, because it was no longer where everybody lived in a neighborhood, and when an issue popped up like the police brutality or the bilingual education thing, it was easy to organize the community. All I had to do was walk down the street, go to St. Michael's, talk to a few people, and boom, you had everybody on the same page. That is um, almost impossible now. It was the other reason why I you know, helped start this radio station as well. Uh, it's just so important to me that we try to reach everybody um, so that we can really start to you know, exercise some clout, because right now, People are living everywhere and have very different experiences. And so their issues are very different, okay? Um, to be honest, I mean, I, though I grew up on, I grew up on the Roth Street, which is near Clifford and Clinton. I live in Pittsburgh now, you know, and 
that that's just you know i wanted more i wanted more space for you know my hobbies we all have different reasons there's no reason anyone has to stay in one place but the goal is to still keep connected with the community for all of us so that you know we we can work on issues together that help solve problems um for all the community so here's a map of concentration of power of, of latinos in 2012 by block group which is a designation um that the census uses so there's sense, you know, census tracts and even smaller than census tracts are block groups. Uh, and you can see concentration still in that Northeast traditional side. That's still a receiving area where people who are coming here to establish themselves go. Um, you know, there's more affordable housing. Uh, there's more people that maybe still speak Spanish that they can navigate themselves through that area. Um, and then from there, you know, decide what they do. So that's still a receiving area as, it, as it's been for, you know, since Rochester was around, before it was, before it was um, the Latino neighborhood, it was the Irish neighborhood. It was the, close to the Jewish neighborhood. Before that, it was German. St. Michael's was actually built by German immigrants. Um, you know, so um, uh, Father Tracy told me a story once how he actually his grandfather lived on Ross Street where I grew up, like a gener several generations before. He was straight from Germany, didn't speak a lick of English, and grew like apples in his backyard. So. Um, you know, that's always been a, a, a receiving track. Um, but you can see there's population of Latinos all throughout the county, throughout. I mean, there's no area that there aren't, you know, folks living. Here is um, uh, from 2010 to 2012. Um, I'm sorry, from 2000 to 2012. So, you know, like I said, we're still waiting for 2020 census data. You can see the, um, the growth of Latinos in certain, um, in certain zip codes. So, um, you know, and where, where Latinos are still mostly concentrated. So you can see 14621, uh, it's still, you know, uh, has uh, the highest concentration, but it also, you can see it's still growing. It grew 29%. Um, but then you can start to look through some of these zip codes, um, like Webster, they grew 134%. Um, you know, some, of these, some of these zip codes, which are Greece, growing, ex, you know, 100, over 100%. Uh, Fairport growing 75%, Brockport. Um, you can just see the growth everywhere. Uh, Pittsburgh grew 80%. Uh, and I'm sure these numbers are probably double what they are in, in this at this point. Uh, Henrietta, a large sizable population of Latinos grew 92%. So you can see there's growth everywhere across the county. Um, and then um, interestingly, you know, it's not just people moving out there. It's also, it, this movement also reflects growth in incomes. So here's the average uh, household income for Latinos in Pittsburgh, 148,000, almost, almost 150,000 a year. Henrietta, very high as well, about 135,000 a year. The, uh, you know, Rush, Menden, Honeyway Falls, Webster, you know, a lot of Latinos are in Webster talking about, you know, 112. So these, and these are from 2012. So you can expect these to be probably at least 25% higher now. Um, and then let's not forget, you know, if you go to the other end of this, you can see in 14621, annual household income for Latinos is 34, 35,000. So, you know, there's still areas. Um, I will say, like I said, that I just want to remind people that some of these zip codes, 14621, those are still a lot of receiving zip codes, but that's why you, you do have a concentration of poverty there that you hear a lot about in the news. Um, and then these two, the 14614 and 14604, those are downtown. So those are kind of anomalies, though uh, most of the population at that time was uh, subsidized housing. A couple of the tower, large towers that were, um, uh, the one on St. Paul, the one over by, um, um, by the um, Martin Luther King Park. So that's why these are so low. A lot of these people are folks that are in, in uh, subsidized housing. It'll be interesting to see how that changes now that so much housing has moved uh, downtown for middle and upper class folks. So, um, so you know, can, can the, a couple of the things looking towards the future uh, is, you know, to what extent are we going to continue to see migration from Puerto Rico? Uh, will the economy stabilize there? You know, most people will tell you that after the Hurricane, it wasn't just a hurricane. I mean, we saw a trickle of people continue for over a year because um, first there was the initial wave, like my house was destroyed and I'm, I'm coming to Rochester because I have family here. And then after that, it was, uh, okay, my house wasn't destroyed, but the factory I worked at has, hasn't reopened. It's been six months, it's been 12 months. You know, my hospital that I worked at has, has downsized. And so we, had, we saw um, a delayed 
um, migration for a substantial amount of time from Puerto Rico. We'll, we'll have to see if that continues um, given whatever the economic state of Puerto Rico is. So that's something to look, keep an eye on in the next few years. Um, two is the preserving of the culture. You know, how, how does the community do that? And that's a topic of discussion for, for a lot of Latinos is, as their kids grow up in Menden and, and Hilton and, you know, they don't speak Spanish. I mean, my Spanish was awful up until um, my years in Miami. And then later on, I made a huge effort to learn it, but my Spanish growing up here in Rochester was terrible. So how do you preserve that culture? Um, third thing is the continued suburban growth. To what extent does that, that continue? Um, and beyond that economic growth, uh, where do we, you know, how do, how do Latinos continue to do economically? Um, and as far as starting businesses and those things, I can tell you one thing that's not in my presentation, but one thing that's really curious is Rochester has like the, it's one of the worst places in the country for Latino entrepreneurship. It's actually also, it does really well as far as um, average income for Latinos, if you take the whole region, it's one of the highest in the country. So I don't know if maybe because people do well, they don't start their own businesses or whatever, but that's something that, you know, we, we're working on at Iberia and working with the city to try to get more economic growth because in most cities latinos are like the entrepreneurial engine they, they start like they'll start like you know a, a little food stand anywhere they'll start you know all kinds of other businesses and we don't have that in rochester to the level that we should um another thing to keep an eye on in the future is uh the fight for political power as i said that that's become dif um, diffused because of people just living everywhere so to what extent do we start to see you know latinos winning an election in Webster or other areas. We did, you know, we, we have seen a little bit of that. You know, where there was a, um, a Latina uh, mayor of Brockport for a number of years. We've had some people run in some of the suburban areas, but you know, to what point do we see that? And then what happens to the concentration of poverty back in those original zip codes in 14621, 14605? Um, how can, well, what can we do to alleviate that, you know? Um, uh, so that, that's a question really for the whole community that I know the whole community is working on. So, um, and that's the presentation. I, I hope you guys have some questions and you know, as you can see, I love talking about this, so. Well, thank you so much, Julio, really appreciate it. Uh, this is wonderful and a topic we really haven't talked about before in Rochester's rich history. So folks, the floor is open. Um, either put your questions in chat or feel free to put on your camera and mic and jump right in. Okay, we have our first question. Uh, this is from Judy. Great presentation, Julio. Thank you. Does the borough collect and report data on the Latino community based on census classifications of white versus non-white Latino slash Hispanic? Yeah, great question. Um, I do some of it um, for, for certain um, grants that we write and some other things. We actually partner with CGR uh, Center for Governmental Research, and we, we've actually hired them the last few years and some other times where they generate a report for us. So um, is my contact, if, there's my contact, and I think my email. Yep, there's my email. So you're welcome to email me and I can send that to you. So we, over the last few years, um, since I've been there and, and our new CEO, Angelica Perez Delgado, we've actually been taking our annual luncheon and turning it into a state of the Latino community. And we put together a report on health, education, economic development, you know, and how we're doing in those areas. So I'd be happy to share that that information with you, that PowerPoint. Let's see, uh, this is from Sofia Quinones. This was fantastic, thank you. Will this recording be accessible by the public? I can answer that. Yes, it'll be up on the RPL YouTube page soon. Uh, my parents came up to New Jersey from Puerto Rico in the 90s, and I think they would love to see this. All right. What other questions do we have? Yeah, and let me just say, if anyone, you know, if you have a group, a church, a school, and you'd like me to present on this, I'd be happy. Uh, and this is my like extended edition, but you know, I have a, a shorter one if there's if there's less time. So any organization that would like me to to speak, I, I obviously love to talk about this. So just shoot me a shoot me an email. I'll put my um, 
I'll put my email address in the in the chat. Do we have any other questions for Julio? Uh, sure. Um, the book title again. Yeah, it's uh, so it's. Um, I don't have a question. Oh, uh -huh. I'll just say the name of the book real quick. Um, Can I say? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this is Claudia Busevara speaking. Sorry, I don't have the camera on. I'm at home doing chores and listening to this, and I just wanted to highlight how amazing this was. Thank you so much, Julio, for this presentation. I mean, all the excellent data is such a detailed picture of uh, the Latino presence throughout the, the, the state and the Rochester community, which usually we really don't see it. I think a lot of times it's invisible. So just thank you so much for, for doing it and thank you to the library for hosting it. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much. Yeah, and the book is called uh, Rochester's Latino History. It's on Amazon. It's a Barnes and Noble. Wegmans used to always have it as well. It's uh, it's the Images of America series by Arcadia Publishing. They're the, actually the largest uh, publisher of his, historical books in the country, and they they so it's available like I say Amazon, um, any bookstore you can find it. Uh, we have a question from Annette Ramos. Thank you, Julio. Wow, learning together about our history. Can you address the creative economy? and local talent impact on the arts. You know me, CJ, always looking how we improve opportunities. Sure, so yeah, so it's interesting that you bring that up. Rochester is always, um, if, if you remember the, the pictures I had from the 1950s of the dances and the Mambo group, uh, Rochester's always had a little more in the arts area than other cities. Um, and we still have that a lot more today. And so um, there's been a lot of folks that, uh, that uh, helped preserve the local Latin dance and culture. You know, we've had musicians since at least the 50s and the 40s. I actually have an older picture that's too blurry to use of the 1940s of Latinos hanging out and playing um, near Rocky's Italian restaurant, which uh, some of the old timers told me was one of the places that allowed Latinos to come and hang out. It's still there, Rocky's Italian restaurant by, by um, Frontier Field. And they, they welcomed the Latinos to come there and it was one of the hangouts for the Latinos in the 1940s. Um, and so even then, lots of musicians, we had Borinca Dance Theater, which actually um, came out of Iberos La Latino um, uh, Cultural Center in the 70s. So a lot of arts, a lot of musicians. We have lots of people here locally that have played with like nationally known groups. Um, you know, um, uh, Johnny Vega, who's a local composer from the 70s, he, he's actually had some of his stuff recorded by Fania artists, some really na famous national artists. Um, Fania was like the Motown of, of Latin music in the 70s and the 80s and still around. Um, so lots of arts, lots of Ramon Santiago. So if you look at my book, I have photos with Ramon Santiago was a very famous painter here in Rochester of uh, um, Spanish heritage from Spain, um, you know, nationally known artist here in Rochester. There's, there's just a long, long history of, um, of Latinos here in the arts being really active and unfortunately not getting the recognition that, that they should. But uh, we've had a hotbed. I mean, just especially in musicians, I mean, um, you, you know, there's uh, the Antonetti family, uh, the Gonzalez family, are very prominent families that have started folks in a lot of groups. Um, there's even a, like a Mark Anthony video that has one of the members of that family playing the timbales. Um, and so just, to, you know, so he, play, he plays and tours with Mark Anthony and like the biggest artists that you can imagine. So all from here in Rochester. Good information. Anyone else like to join us with a question? Cool guys. Hey, uh, I just have one other question too. Uh, I, I wonder if you maybe there were other recommendations you had in terms of books or resources to learn more. Um, both about larger, you know, kind of history, but also specific here in Rochester. You know, I know a, a while back, like the city of Rochester had their, you know, a little book they published of, of ancestors, you know, just of local folks. Are there other kinds of resources uh, like that that would be really great for folks to pick up? 
So unfortunately, there there is for local the the only other thing that's available was Julio Vasquez wrote his memoirs of arrive. It's called uh, the journey of a Puerto Rican hero. Yeah, and it was available on uh, it was available on the um, on the Apple bookstore, and he does have copies. Um, if you reach out to me, I can put you in contact with him because they're very comprehensive. It's all the story of how you know his, his dad brought him here in the in the '60s and in the early '60s and their struggle with discrimination and picking apples in the summer for extra money and um, it's just, it's a lot of great. And then uh, he eventually became one of the you know founders of Ibero and later on the CEO and then a commissioner for the city. He owned the Super Duper, so just a long history. And through through his eyes, you can get a lot of details of of uh, what happened in the community during that time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question from Judy. How does Ibero's data on the economic conditions of the Latino community in Rochester compare to the data reported by ACT Rochester in their poverty reports? Oh, so actually we, we, um, we use similar data. So it's, it's the same. The only thing we're trying to do a little more of is, so the thing is like, you know, there's, there's primary research and secondary research, you know, your primary your secondary research is we buy, you know, from a research company, which right now, most of the major market, well, none of the market, major marketing research companies um, cover Rochester anymore for Latinos. Mm -hmm. So what happened is it used to be Scarborough. This is back to my marketing, my marketing background. Scarborough was one of the best comprehensive marketing research companies. So when I worked at the DNC, we would buy those reports and it would show total, you know, household income for Rochester. I still remember when it hit cross over a billion dollars in Latinos in Rochester. Uh, but that's from like 2005, 2000, and there's been nothing. And then Scarborough got bought by Nielsen, uh, which is another, you know, you know them from the radio and TV ratings. When they bought Scarborough, they stopped doing research on on Hispanics in most cities and just focused on like the top 20. So, you know, Miami and Houston, LA, those large Hispanic markets. So they stopped covering. So right now we're trying to fill that gap. So the mm -hmm. info, info that uh, the ACT website does um, is very similar to, uh, it's from the same sources. They actually use CGR for a lot of it. So, and, and so, but one of the things we're trying to do this year is look to see how we can do some more qualitative research. Those kind of surveys on, you know, why haven't you started a business? Why, you know, what are your barriers? So we do want to start that this year to try to, um, to get some more qualitative do, uh, research and do our own um, primary research instead of just relying on the secondary research, the census and other things like that. Uh, we have a question from Thomas Sosa. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Julio. What are some of the primary opportunities for cultural exchange among different Latino communities that Rochester has to offer? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. So um, I would say a couple of things. One, listen to the radio station, and I'm not just promoting the radio station. It's just because we're a community station. It's not for their 97.1. We basically um, any kind of local community events we advertise for free. So anything that's going on, you're going to hear on the radio station. Uh, whether it's a Parranda or the Latino Theater, um, Latino th uh, Theater Group, which Annette Ramos, who uh, was the founder of, she, her and Stephanie Perez, she's logged in now. Um, you know, they founded that group, and you know, so if there's plays going on, if there's concerts, you know, we because of the radio station and the sizable amount of people, we actually have some really big artists to come here from 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 Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, and and so we've actually had, we actually have some pretty big stars that come here. So all that stuff is on the radio station, as well as like, you know, church bake sales and all those kinds of things that are on. But most of the Latino restaurants are on there as well. So um, there's that you know, for a general constant feed of what's going on. And then you don't want to miss the Puerto Rican festival. That's like, you know, where everybody comes together every year uh, to see each other. Um, and then the Red Wings normally do a Latino night as well. That is also very popular. A lot of the community comes out for that. Um, and then the other big event is there's um, the, the public market also usually has like a food truck Latino night with band and bands. And, and so another great event where you just come out and you see people, you could try food, um, you know, a lot of good stuff. Um, if it Torres has to say that she loves Poder 97.1, it is indeed an excellent resource and you can get in via iTunes as well. 
Yeah, we're on iTunes. And if you have an Alexa, you could just say Alexa, play Poder 97.1, and it'll start playing as well. So cool. we have any other questions. Cool. All right. Very good. Well, folks, if we don't have any more questions, thank you so much all for joining us. Thank you, Julio, for joining us today. It's really appreciated. Uh, we'll return next month uh, with a presentation on presentation from Lou DeCaro Jr., the author of The Untold Story of Shields Green on March 17th. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody.